Welcome to Stats and Scheme. I am Sean Saya, joined as always by my good friend Tej Seth. Today we are rounding out free agency with our new faces, new places show on the defensive side of the ball. We will do one stat and one scheme-ish point for a bunch of players and talk about some units that are really starting to take shape. But first, Tej, how are you doing? Are you ready for us to move through free agency and into the draft? Is it draft season for you yet? Talk to me. <laughs> I mean, it's been draft season since uh, since February for me, but free agency is always a nice blip in that, um, you know, especially as a Lions fan this year, like draft season starts very early in most years when they're out of the playoff race, you start looking at prospects in like November, December, but this year you, you we actually started in, in February, but I agree. Like, I, I think it's still a lot of fun to talk about free agency and, and some of these moves and how they can impact teams. Look, whatever can give you as a, as a really anyone as a fan, just hope is is a really big thing so the draft you know you assume all these new players are going to come in free agency the same page you know i am one to want to spread positivity sorry so we'll start off uh as i said defensive side of the ball one stat one scheme kind of ish point there's going to be a ton of players that we talk about i think some players maybe we'll group together uh again uh, talking a little bit less about kind of contract situations but i do think we got have to start here at the cornerback position, particularly with the news over the weekend of the Legarius Sneed trade from the Chiefs to the Titans. I think it was 2025 third round pick and like a seventh round pick swap this year. Eric Eager and Ben Brown had a good discussion about the trade over the weekend that's in your podcast feeds. Tej, where do you think we should start on this one? Do you want to go player specific? Do you want to talk about cornerbacks more generally? What are you thinking here? Yeah, I mean, we, I think we should talk about cornerbacks more generally before we jump into Sneed in particular. Like, I think you know, people were surprised by the trade comp that the Titans ended up getting to get him. And I think when you look at the overall cornerback market and what we know about cornerbacks year to year, like there's there's a lot of good corners in the league and, and a lot of them are able to stay good um, from season to season. But based on the data that we have and, and we look at, like coverage is just something that's a little bit more unstable from season N to season N plus one, then pass rush, then, uh, you know, passing offense. Like those are usually things that stay more stable. They're more player centric and, and coverage can vary a lot. So, you know, I think that when, when you're the Titans in this trade and you look at the trade compensation that ended up happening, the Chiefs were looking at it from a, a perspective of like LeJerry Sneed is probably not going to have as good of a year next year as he did this year. I think the Titans were looking at it the same way. And so the Chiefs just wanted to beat the comp pick that they were going to get from him walking in free agency, whether that was going to be a third or a fourth next year. And that's what they ended up getting in this trade. The fragility year over year for cornerback play is, I, I mean, I'm glad that you kind of looked into a few things on that. And I guess when I'm thinking about it, a lot for a cornerback is out of the cornerback's hands, right? They 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 don't always choose specifically from the cornerback's perspective, hey, I'm going to guard this receiver. So literally who you play changes from a year-to-year basis, whether you know you get certain WR1s or you get other receivers who maybe aren't as uh, kind of good in that situation. And then like every tech coverage technique, it has a weak spot. Like there is just no coverage that is, that is perfect. And even if you say, hey, man, coverage, you're going to take this person wherever you go. Usually, like you are playing with your lever- leverage, and whether you're trying to push a receiver kind of to like a deep post defender uh, in cover one, for example. And, and I think like coverage is just so, so hard. Like, obviously, we talk about the rules and the receivers get better, the quarterbacks get better, but there's also just situations where I don't know. I, I'm not sure if you agree with this, but I think that sometimes on their like production basis, there are times when the receiver just comes down with the ball, and that's gonna, mm-hmm. gonna look obviously worse for you. And times where they don't, where the coverage can be equally as good, right? The kind of saying like a perfect or no coverage beats a perfect throw. So I don't know. This is just something that I keep racking in my head. And then, Tasha, of course, pass rush, pass rush does matter a lot there. I think if I, well, as a cornerback, like the number one, one of the number one things I would want is like have Miles Garrett there or have Michael Parsons <laughs> there to make my life easier. Whether it's, you know, if you can just impact the quarterback a little bit from a rush perspective, even if it's like, you know, there's a hand in the throwing lane or a quarterback gets moved off their spot. And then whatever you're doing on the pass coverage aspect, like it just becomes a little bit less. So I don't know if there's any of those points you kind of want to build off of, but it kind of breaks my heart, right? Cause we we don't have, and I don't think we need to have like, Oh, this, this cornerback is going to follow the other player or the best player around. Like that's just not like the game that we, that we watch anymore. And that's, that is fine, right? We're not going to have those kinds of players, but you know, Snead is one of the players uh, who did really shadow a decent 
bit. But then, you know, on, on an offensive side, you get in a stack, get in your bunch, just you know, maybe the rules are just too in favor of the offense. <laughs> well, I think you do touch on a lot of like interesting points there where when you look at coverage as a whole, and I'm saying the ways that we currently have to measure coverage is what's unstable year to year compared to the ways that we have to measure pass rush. Like, obviously, we don't have a, a, a perfect metric to sum up every player on the field on every play, but just like the stats that we look at happens to be more unstable uh, when, when we're going from season end to season end plus one. But like the point that you talked about that was really interesting to me was like the production side of things where when you look at a defensive lineman, a lot of what they do is is pretty binary, sack or no sack, pressure or no pressure, tackle for loss or no tackle for loss. When you look at a, a back seven player, especially a defensive back, they have a very wide range of distribution uh, of a distribution that can happen on a play, right? Like it could range from, uh, you know, think about like Deron Bland's season where he was getting a lot of pick sixes. A lot of those plays were, were changing the games in a positive way. Think about that Seahawks game in particular against DK Metcalf when, you know, he was he was trying to jump the ball. Uh, you know, Gino, Gino Smith was having a great game. DK Metcalf had a great game. And when he was letting up completions, they happened to be like these 60, 70 yard completions. And you think about that way that distribution is, is spread out where like, that's, that's what I'm saying about corners is like specifically when we go into LeJarius Sneed here, like the Chiefs allowed 43.8 yards per game to wide receiver ones in 2023, which is the best mark in the NFL. In the regular season, they didn't give up over 80 yards of receiving to, to a single wide receiver one. Zay Flowers finally broke that streak in the in the playoffs. And as our friend Arjun's pointed out, Sneed had the second highest rate of lining up against wide receiver ones the entire season. So, you know, when I look at Sneed into next year, like I think he's going to be a good corner again. Like he, he has a lot of the traits that you talked about that should 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 do that. But like all it takes is him letting up one 50 yard touchdown and that 80 yard or less streak is broken just because of the way that coverage is, is measured and, and kind of like the outcomes that can happen when you're a, a defensive back. Yeah, we're so drawn to production and finding, well, what is the best kind of production metric there? And I do think cornerback is certainly one where, you know, like you should kind of, I guess there are going to be plays in my mind where you can get a plus grade and you have let up a catch. I, I think that that is absolutely true. I think a lot depends, as I said, like within your scheme, like what is your responsibility? I think there's a lot of times where we see whether it's like a cornerback who's playing like a deep third and they let up a curl or something. And I think people really may, might get on that cornerback where it's like, you know, like they're defending a, a little bit of a different part of the field. So, I mean, yeah, look at me just just pushing for the the film side on that. But I, I'm glad, you know, in the Sneed specific examples, of course, one of the top cornerbacks in free agency, probably the one uh, at the top there. I think we think of him most recently, just like jamming those Dolphins receivers in the cold. And, you know, he does really bring a lot uh, to a secondary with plays on the ball. I think now when you have just continued offenses that condense their sets uh we think in this division example of the titans against the texans like when the texans get tight and if they get the running back out to the edge cornerback has to make a tackle Snead, i think is more than happy to do that uh and then when offenses get in those condensed sets if on the defensive side you kind of have to get into the different cover two looks Snead is awesome in that and then we think about it well there it's the colts where they have michael pittman of course uh Snead, i'm sure will will follow him and there'll be a lot of physicality there, so I think we we feel good about the move for the Titans, right? In terms of at least the player, and now they bring in Snead, they bring in Chido Uze, uh, and that is a like two new quarterbacks. I think that's a, a good system where they have you know man in his own capability, their versatility there. I like that. They have uh, I think Denard Wilson is the defensive coordinator there, who was most recently with the Ravens. So to me, it feels like you know that's a, a flexible uh, cornerback duo that you should feel positive for if you're Tennessee. Yeah, that's a great point. Like I think. When you bring up tackling on the on the cornerbacks in particular, especially some of those Colts Titans games, uh, or sorry, uh, Titans Texans games that we're going to see, uh, where that's going to that's a that's going to be a huge focal point for the the defensive backs on the Titans is like how much yards after catch are they going to be able to let up? And I think about like you know what you mentioned earlier, where you can have good coverage but still let up a catch. But I think what that good coverage lets you do is at least you're able there. You're you're able to to tackle you're you're in the spot to to either wrap up the wide receiver or slow them down for someone else to come and, and assist you on the tackle like i think that stuff is going to be so important for the titans defense as they're going up against all these high profile offenses in the afc as a whole and in their division that's a good point if you're a little bit riskier playing on the ball and maybe you know you missed the interception and you're just the receivers pass you at that point that is a big difference between if you're 
a coverage player that's there. You know, and I don't maybe Tish, maybe I overrate cornerbacks in the run game. Like, you think that's a, that's a real important thing to me on film? I think it's just like a stylistic thing. I love to see when a cornerback really wants to get involved there, particularly of how much offenses want to push the ball to the edge and make your cornerback be the person to tackle as opposed to messing around inside. I don't know if you have any thoughts kind of from a either a stats perspective or just kind of thought perspective. Maybe it's just maybe it's just my flavors for cornerback. No, I mean, I think it's a great point to bring up because you look at some of the, the best offenses in the league last year and they had very tight formations on average, right? Like they weren't spreading out their receivers doing doing four wide. Um, you know, they were trying to keep things condensed. And so when you do keep those things, uh, when you keep your formations condensed, like that's really where we'll have to see cornerbacks get tested when tackling. Or, you know, if you have a, a plus one in the, the run game from a blocking perspective, you know, like that could be a, a tight end that gets matched up on a corner and like how well the corner is able to evade that tight end's block is, is pretty crucial to allow these runs. So I think it's definitely fair for you to include that in your analysis. Like I think that sometimes wide receiver blocking and, and cornerback tackling in the run game like sometimes get lost and in, in the overall image of a player but like i think that some of the stuff that people are working on you know at sumer uh trying to like give a, a grade to to players on, on all plays and stuff like i think that's going to be really important for evaluating players in the future look at this talking about blocking and tackling Tish, <laughs> i was thinking after i saw the steed news that my mind immediately met, went to like i you know how much i love Trent mcduffie like do you, do you think the chiefs are gonna let him walk in a few years it feels like this is kind of their mo Obviously, you can't pay every single player on your roster. Uh, I don't know if you have any projection for that, but maybe I guess by then, if Chris Jones is off, uh, I don't know, like however the years kind of match up, but I'm worried about our guy Trent. I know. I mean, we thought Trent McDuffie should have been considered for Super Bowl MVP, like he had that good of a game. And I think he, he's going to be really interesting because, um, you know, I think he's he's pretty tied to to Steve Spagnola in a sense where like he's doing he's doing a lot of the blitzing, uh, the slot pressures. Like again, you think about some of those in the Super Bowl or, or throughout the whole Chiefs playoff run. But I mean, the, the Chiefs kind of have this the setup and this mentality where they feel like because of the coaches that they have and the infrastructure they have in place that they can develop defensive backs better than the average team. Their track record speaks for itself in, in that regard. So like maybe they feel like they're able to do that and they can just kind of keep drafting corners on, on day two and early day three and making them into starting level corners and, and just keep turning from that perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that I'm really happy that Snead got uh, a bag there. I think that's mm -hmm. that, that is real good for him. Do you think that th that situation particularly, like should that inform us at all in terms of like, oh, maybe cornerback is maybe less of a premium position than than we kind of usually associate it with, just like how how they approach corners. Uh, and man, I don't know. I, I'm, it would be hard for it to spread across the league because you don't have C. Spagnuolo and all those kind of coaches there. Do you think there's any comment there? Or is that going too far into it? Yeah, I think that's, a, I mean, that's, that is a fair point to bring up. But going back to like what we talked about with the, uh, you know, how often players actually <clears throat> reach free agency, they're only 20% of the top 15 highest paid corners that reach free agency, which is middle of the pack. Um, you know, right near, near edge rush or near offensive tackle. So I still think that they're in that like middle premium tier. And like sometimes a, a, a team like the chiefs that have all these, you know, high paid players at the position. Um, Creed Humphrey is, is eventually someone that's going to become probably the highest paid center in the league. You know, our, our friend Eric has been talking a lot about what they're going to do with their guard situation. And if they're going to trade that, like, I think it's just some of the sacrifices that you have to make. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And as you said, you know, not all the cornerbacks are going to hit free agency. Someone who certainly did it, uh, Jalen Johnson re-signing with the Bears. And I mean, he's just a stud on the outside in my mind. I really, really love watching him. He had an awesome play against the Vikings last year where he kind of like passed off an underneath route and then kind of climbed up to a corner route for a really nice interception. I think he's versatile in man and zone, loves to make plays on the ball. Don't we all, but he really can. Uh, I also another just player where he is a willing tackler on the outside. And yeah, I, I keep, I'll think about that more as I evaluate these players. Maybe I'm giving them too much of a boost there, but what do you have from a stat perspective for Jalen Johnson? Yeah. I mean, Jalen Johnson last year allowed 0 0.47 uh, yards per pass snap, which was the best among all cornerbacks in the NFL. He also allowed a negative 11% CPOE when targeted, which was the fourth best. Um, you know, I think we're, we're messaging, uh, you know, off this podcast about like, how CPOE when targeted is sometimes influenced by the pass rush that you have on your team. But like Jalen Johnson did a lot of that without a true pass rush for most of the year until Montez Sweat showed up. So like very impressive season from him. Yeah, they bring in Sweat. And then I think 
I'm sure Bears fans would would love for them to bring in one more uh, edge rusher, whether it's maybe it's someone just in that kind of later phase in free agency. But Johnson, he's a young young player, and and I guess he was in conversations or maybe just on Twitter, people thinking, you know, are are is Chicago going to ship him out at the trade deadline? So I am happy to see him back. I really want to see uh, him against Justin Jefferson this year. I think that'll be a lot of fun. And then now, I, Tej, I think from the offensive side last week and then uh, looking just at their roster a little bit more and more on defense, like there are clear holes, but I don't know. I feel, I feel myself kind of getting talked into the Bears, but that may be just me kind of kind of looking for hope uh, going forward. <laughs> well, the NFC North is just going to be fascinating these next couple of years because each team is at a little bit of a different stage in their rebuild, but like you're, you're bullish on all of them for, for different reasons um, between, you know, the Lions who've kind of already established themselves, the Packers who are like that team where they, they probably have a higher ceiling than the Lions just because of how young they are everywhere across the team. Um, and then the Bears and Vikings that are that are looking to get new quarterbacks this offseason. Like it, it's going to be really interesting to see how this division ends up progressing uh, later on. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll we'll stick in the division and stay on board with cornerbacks for now. The Lions trade for Carlton Davis, sign Emmanuel Mosley, and then uh, Chase, they signed on Mc Robinson, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So they got you got three guys there. Uh, I think that is an interesting group. Uh, I think it's like creative and well, how do you find cornerbacks? I think Brad Holmes did cornerback scouting work for the Rams during his time there. I'm sure he really loves it. Of course, you get. Mosley off that ACL injury. Uh, Amic Robinson, I think he played some like nickel for the Raiders, bumped out. I think he was like, he was a pretty physical player in college. So hopefully you can kind of bring that attitude. Of course, in the secondary, you lose uh, Chauncey Gardner Johnson. We've talked about Brian Branch so much. He is, he is really, really a star. Uh, Carlton Davis, I think he absolutely has really high level playability. Of course, you want him to be able to stay healthy there. So I, I think it's an, it's an interesting approach in that. Like I said, to me, it was creative. Well, you trade for these players because, as we said, these players aren't really hitting free agency. And if you have three guys, you know, you get a hit on like one and a half. I think that's a really, really big win. So what did you have kind of on maybe some stats for the Lions approach here overall and then some thoughts as well? I think you summarized that really well. I think what the Lions are trying to do here is buy low on some players who could play coverage pretty well, but just haven't recently. Um, you know, Robertson ranked 70th in, in yards allowed per pass snap. Uh, Carlton Davis ranked 111th last year in that same metric. Emmanuel Mosley is coming off back-to-back ACLs. So like, it's, it's, it's not like you're, you're investing a ton of capital in this group. I think that, you know, the Lions original plan was to take Devin Witherspoon at, at number six overall last year. He ended up getting taken a pick before. Um, so this is kind of like the backup plan to that, where you're throwing a bunch of darts at the dartboard. You're hoping some of them can hit, uh, you know, somewhere on that dartboard and, and get you some points. And, you know, I think they're going to drafting someone either with number 29 overall or on day two. So you're going to hope that out of the the four or five corners that you have invested, you know, moderate amount of of capital into that two of them are able to start for you. Yeah. You know, overall, I I think, as you said, like the buy low, I I do think it's a small or it is a smart idea. You, You at least produce some sort of kind of filling for some of those gaps on your defense where I think last year. Or even last week, we talked about Mike Evans kind of beating up the Lions secondary in some different ways. So if you can plug those holes, maybe it gives you a little bit of flexibility in the draft. I would love for a cornerback uh, to end up there because I do think Aaron Glenn wants to play a lot more man coverage than maybe he felt like he was forced. I imagine he ranked probably pretty highly in man coverage anyway. And then we'll we'll get to uh, some of their moves on the defensive line a little bit later. And maybe, Tish, I'm just talking myself into into everyone uh today on the on the free agency show uh continuing at cornerback let's go to kendall fuller from washington going uh landing in miami what'd you have for kendall fuller yes yeah, so you talked about what, earlier when we we're doing our quarterback discussion about like how corner is, is so influenced by a situation and i think the washington d- back seven room or defensive back room last year was was in a pretty rough state and so kendall fuller was was trying to hold up a lot he ended up ranking 78th in yards allowed per pass snap. That was better than, than Benjamin St. Juice. That was better than Emmanuel Forbes. Um, you know, like he he was a corner in a, in a very tough situation on a on a Washington defense last year that, that traded away its its edge rushers and 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 put the the corners into a, a bad spot. So I, I again like I think it's Miami trying to buy low on someone who who wasn't as productive as they could be last year. Yeah. And you know he gets to join Jalen Ramsey under mm-hmm. Anthony Weaver, who Weaver's another coach that got picked out of that Ravens room. So you know, yeah, Fuller might not be the top cornerback in free agency, considering, of course, Snead and Johnson, but Miami moved off Xavier Howard. So now you got 
Ramsey and Fuller. They bought in Jordan Poyer. You got Javon Holland there, who's really a rock solid safety. So that's actually, you know, a group of four that uh, I kind of like. So maybe, I, I mean, I don't know. There's not a lot of these, these guys I think I'm going to feel super, super negative about. But you're right, like projecting cornerback play from year to year is really hard. From team to team is super hard mm -hmm. because, like, as you said, you know, you're playing one part of a, a much larger role. And I don't know, maybe I'm getting radicalized and just thinking, just just sign up all those edge rushers and then figure it out on the back end a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's interesting, right? Because, like, when we look at the Buccaneers team, especially the one that won the Super Bowl, like, they had multiple drafts where they were just, they were just taking, like, three defensive backs multiple years in a row, and, like, it all kind of came together um, for them. Like, once they signed Tom Brady and Tony Brown, and then they ended up winning the Super Bowl. The Bengals, when they made the Super Bowl, like, kind of a similar strategy where they were just they were just signing multiple defensive backs in free agency every year before they ended up making it. And so it's like, yeah, like, maybe you, you really invest in your edge rushers. You make sure you get, like, guys who can play 80%, 90% of the snaps in a game and, and can really disrupt it. And then on the back end, you take, a, a you know, a different approach where you're putting a bunch of day two, day three picks. You're putting a bunch of mid-level free agency signings into there. Like, that is one way to approach it. Obviously, you can you can flip it and do the other way, and that that's worked as well. But those are just, just some recent examples that come to mind uh, with the former way. Yes, keep th keep throwing those darts, especially in that yeah. uh, defensive back room. So moving from cornerbacks to just a few safety signings, Avery McKinney uh, from the Giants ends up in Green Bay. What'd you have for McKinney, Tish? <laughs> well, I didn't really have a, a, a stat for McKinney, but I think it's just the Packers continuing the, the Leonardo DiCaprio age cutoff across the roster. Like we talked about it with moving on from Aaron Jones to Josh Jacobs. I think very similar thing here where McKinney is only 24 years old signing his second contract. Like that's, that's a very young age to, to be getting, uh, you know, a second contract. So like, I think that the Packers are going to end up doing that here where, where they just want to get younger at that position. Yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio is a great reference. You know, he's got a movie, I think, coming out next year with Paul Thomas Anderson, but we'll keep that out for uh, a different podcast and the news on the movies. But McKinney, he, like when I watch it, like he feels like just like he plays very fast. Uh, I think he can play against tight ends a bit. So, you know, hopefully we can see him uh, what Green Bay does against Sam Laporta this year. I think that'll be cool. I think for Jeff Halfley, the new defensive coordinator there, there's just a question. Well, what is that defense going to look like? Uh, Halfley cro crossed over with Robert Salah previously. You know, is it? Or I imagine that Green Bay just wants a change from their defense in uh, a few different ways from what they had last year. But, you know, I can see McKinney rolling down into the box and uh, kind of getting his nose dirty in a few different ways. Uh, Tish, we'll move to the next safety here. Geno Stone going from Baltimore to Cincinnati. Uh, and I really just love versatile safeties. <laughs> I really do. I love safeties that can recognize routes really well. I think Geno Stone is one of those types of players. He was really, really a ball hawk last year. Uh, I think it's a good upgrade for Cincinnati's defense where I think they had some atrophy last year, obviously losing Jesse Bates among others. And there was just like a really sweet play from Geno Stone last year where it was against the Texans. I think it was in the playoffs where, they, yeah, they had like the flea flicker throwback screen. Uh, he had the interception against the Bengals in the red zone where he's kind of working across the field. And, you know, we're, I think last year, like with Lou Anarumo, we didn't talk about him a whole ton. I think there was that 49ers game that was pretty sweet, but you know, Cincinnati adds Von Bell as well there. So they, I think, want to get uh, Lou back to the cooking that we had from two years ago. What did you have on Geno Stone? Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the Bengals, uh, you know, defensive back room last year was was not as talented as it was in previous years, which we just talked about with like some of their free agency strategies from a couple of years ago. And I think this is like their way to kind of get back uh, to that level where Geno Stone was the fifth best strong safety in terms of yards allowed per pass snap last season. Like, I think it's a great signing, um, you know, to, to, to not only like bring him onto your team, but you're also taking him away from your division rival. And, and he worked really well with Kyle Hamilton last year. And, and I think that the, the Bengals are, are going to be able to use him in, in a lot of versatile ways, like you mentioned. Yeah, I just love seeing like that Ravens team from, from last year. Like where where does everyone go? Where's how is everyone play? Like where's Javen Clowney going to sign? Even that uh, obviously Matabuke is someone who returned, but. Uh, all the players who we were so happy to watch last year go in different places. Yeah. Uh, next up, we'll go to Cam Curl, who goes from Washington and ends up with the Rams. What'd you have for Cam Curl, Tish? So again, like the, he was the only bright spot for the commander secondary last season, uh, ranked 16th in, in tackle rate, 27th in yards allowed per covered snap and 24th in completion percentage over expected when targeted. So, you know, I thought he was, he was someone that, 
Uh, it was it was another good signing by the Rams in a sense where he's he can play and, and work across the field. Like I think that his anticipation is is really really good, and I think that's exactly someone you want to sign into a pretty young defense. Yeah, and the defense that now they have Chris Shula as a defensive coordinator. He was at uh, John Carroll back when Brandon Staley was there as well, and just with the Rams after that. So I assume there's going to be carryover in scheme, including what Raheem Morris kind of put his little twist there. So they one who have versatile safeties that can move around in a few different ways and you know like we've been talking about i think it, it can be hard to project how does a defensive player fit right into a defense obviously with a lot of moving parts and another i think safety that is going to be an important one i think in a lot of ways is chauncey Gardner johnson ends up uh leaving the lines that goes to the eagles uh, in a big fangio scheme that really really you know needs a versatile safety in a lot of ways last year they had kevin byard and reed blankenship and then sydney brown uh, was injured pretty early on and you know Fangio wants to drop a safety into the box pretty often obviously in in the run game and I do think he like he can be an impact player I think he has ball hawk ability as well obviously you hope that he's able to stay healthy what'd you have uh, as a staff for Chauncey Gardner Johnson yeah I mean you mentioned it like he he was just not a guy that was able to stay healthy last year but you go back two years ago six interceptions with the Eagles. Like they moved, they switched his role when he came from the saints and it was a role that suited him really well. So I think that they're going to be able to take a lot of notes from that with the Fangio's new defense coming in and, and he should be pretty well suited to uh, get back to being a pretty good ball Hawk. Yeah. I love the, like he was in obviously, or he was in Philadelphia before he left. Maybe it was like a little bit of a sour breakup comes back. And then, you know, the social media team in Philadelphia does a great job. So that's going to finish out our secondary our look at players in the secondary, but we can stay in Philadelphia talking about Bryce Huff from the Jets last year, of course, now with the Eagles as well. What'd you have for Bryce Huff, Tej? I could do a whole episode on Bryce Huff stats, but I'll keep it just to one here. So he had a 15.6% pressure rate per pass snap, which was first in the entire league last season, only played 40% of the snaps. So, you know, we're going to see his snap share go up. His pressure rate will probably come down, but he's still someone that can get pressures at such a high level. And, and you know, it continues for the, the Eagles to kind of get younger on, on their defensive line and, and even possibly more efficient. Okay, like rate or volume? You know, you got to choose one. Which one do you want? Are you a rate guy or are you a volume guy? <laughs> well, uh, this is like choosing between, uh, you know, between my kids for like favorite kid or something. But uh, <laughs> I I guess I guess I would choose volume. I, I think there is signal in, in the volume side of things, oh, yeah. but, but obviously <laughs> rate can, is important. We can get more thoughts on, on your parenting advice uh, and your tips, maybe, <laughs> maybe on another podcast. So th there's this uh, Howie Roseman quote. It's like to win a Super Bowl, you either need the best player or to make a decision that could cost you your job, which like, I mean, I don't think Howie Roseman's job is, is up for like, like real debate in any way, but I just like, I like the idea of that. Like don't optimize for average. Like you're, you are going to have to make these kind of moves sometimes and not that this specifically is a move. I really just wanted to, to mention that quote. Uh, in a little bit of a way, but like Huff is, he's a third down pass rush star. He is exceptional, exceptional get off speed. And I think Philadelphia really <laughs> needs to change the narrative on what happened last year, particularly on third downs on defense. And I thought that those third downs make made life a lot harder on Slay and Bradbury in the secondary. So you hope, you know, Hey, if you have this third down pass rusher, he can like really second order effects and help other players out in different ways. And it's going to be just a really great test case of someone that's, you know, slowly expanding their snap count. I imagine that he is, are they going to want him to be a, a pretty much an every down player, but like, is he going to be a stand up uh, like edge kind of or outside linebacker in three, four situations? Is it going to be someone that we drop out in pass coverage, but also like you can't have too many, like enough pass rushers. There's always, always room for more. And it seems like sweat is staying. We're not really sure what is happening with Reddick there, but I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like I, I, I want to see it. I, I love watching him in, in small spurts. I'm excited to see him, you know, play the play against the run game more as well. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is going to be really interesting to, to follow. Like I'm, I'm fascinated to see what his, his rate stats end up looking like by the end of the year where it's like, yeah, if, if his role is going to increase, um, you know, how's his, his run defense going to look? He was someone that got pressures at a very high rate, but his time to pressure was about average. So it's like, is, is that going to be increased or decreased depending on the situation that they're using him in? Like, it's going to be really, really fascinating to follow. I'm excited for it. Yeah. And look, I mean, I'm rooting super hard for him. I hope he continues those crazy, crazy uh, production numbers or creates more production numbers just based on some of those 
uh, rate stats. All right, we'll move on to Brian Burns, who ends up going from Carolina, gets traded to the Giants and signing a big extension there. Why don't you lead off there, Tage, with Brian Burns? Yeah, I thought this was, you know, a pretty good trade by Carolina to to get something for Brian Burns and and kind of work on on building up their offense. And I think when when you look at Brian Burns as a whole, like Seth Walder does such a good job of putting out different charts for edge rushers and defensive tackles. And he's someone that had a 21% pass rush win rate last year. He wasn't double teamed that often. And I think that should probably stay the same going to the Giants. Like he, he might even be double teamed less just because of some of the other defensive line talent that they have there between between Thibodeau and, and Dexter Lawrence. So like I think that's going to be a pretty good situation for Burns. Um, and then I think he, he should be able to keep that pass rush win rate at a pretty high level. Tajan, you put a nice little uh, chart in our Google Doc, and you know who's above Brian Burns is Bryce Huff, who we just talked about. Excited for him to get more snaps. Yeah, I I do. I actually really like this move for the Giants. Uh, I like to think about some of these moves. Well, what does your room look like in that position? And to me, like the Giants pass rush of uh, Kayvon Thib- Thibodeau, Dexter Lawrence, and then Brian Burns together, like that's a really good unit. And whoever your fourth guy is filling in there, if we just think about a four-man pass rush, whether it's, you know, you want to slide your center to Lawrence and that means like Burns and Thibodeau really get those kind of true one on one. So, you know, you hope that Brian Burns just by virtue of that, by his placement, doesn't have to face some of those double teams. And that kind of helps kind of everyone all around. And then Shane Bowen is a defensive coordinator now. They are now from the Titans who last year maybe didn't have the greatest year uh, ever. But, you know, I think going back to the year before that, they had some interesting plans for dealing with Travis Kelsey. So I like that defensive line, you know, Tej, I don't know if you, if you feel decent about that. I mean, it is a very exciting defensive line unit. I think that the the film is probably a little bit higher on on Brian Burns than the the advanced stats are, right? Like Brian Burns has a good pass rush run rate, has a good pressure rate. It's outside of the top ten though among edge rushers. So I think hopefully a new situation kind of is is uh, you know helpful for him to get back up to that top ten level. Like I think you know he was someone who's who's really really good a couple of years ago, and then maybe because of the other defensive line talent not being able to help him that much in Carolina, like he dropped down a little bit. So you know, I think hopefully we we see him uh, have a jump up in his production numbers when he's he's playing in New York as well. Now the new situation, Jonathan Grenard goes from Houston, ends up in Minnesota. And well, I think we can talk about Grenard and Hunter a little bit together because it feels like they, they kind of just, you know, swap places and uh, like the places that the Texans and the Vikings are in their team building processes are interesting. But we'll start off with Grenard. Tej, what'd you have uh, from a stats view from Grenard? Yeah, so Grenard was 13th in sack rate per pass snap last year, fourth in tackle for loss rate per run snap. So his sacks did outperform his pressures by a little bit. So we could expect some regression there, but he's still really young. Like there's always room for improvement. And I think that you're getting a player that can affect both aspects of the game. Like that's always going to be really exciting for Minnesota. So the sacks outperforming pressure, right? Because we think from one year to uh, to the next, pressure is more indicative of like of your sacks than like sack two from year one to year two, correct? Right. Yeah. The, the, if you were to, to build a model um, you, and to predict sacks the, the next year, pressure rate would be more predictive of sacks in the next year than just sack rate of the previous year. Yeah. So then there's a built in concern there a little bit where kind of you said, right, if your sacks are outperforming your pressure numbers, you know, maybe that's not the, the best thing in the world. But like you said, like he is he's young. And I guess, you know, kind of the gamble you have to take, right? Like if you're like, how many of these edge rushers are you going to be able to? Uh, to get you're gonna have to uh back back up the, the brink truck a little bit for, for these guys so i get like if you're gonna make a gamble on a player it's a player like this i think right exactly yeah i mean i think that when you look at minnesota's move to let daniel hunter walk bring in grenard like they expect to be competitive in, in 2025 which is right when grenard is, is going to be hitting his peak Whereas Hunter might be a player who is slowly starting to decline at that age. So it's like, yeah, like I I see this from Minnesota's perspective as like the move you'd want to make, assuming that that Grenard and Hunter are relatively similar in terms of production. Yeah. Just thinking about uh, back to Grenard a little bit, very, very quick player feels like he's a player that has a pass rush, pass rush plan. He sets up his moves and I think has a bit of power there too. So your hope is that, you know, whether his sack numbers outperformed his pressure numbers from last year, through you know his development obviously everyone's development is not just uh, linear but he's able to kind of close that gap a little bit and then on the other side of it daniel hunter uh from minnesota to houston i think you you could argue that hunter is a better player right now than grenard 
uh, is. Of course, the Hunter's older. He's had some of the health issues. Uh, he's like kind of an unconventional pass rusher. He has this kind of like herky jerky arm pull move that it just like finds the way to win. So it's it's fun to see on film because it is like stylistically different. I think he had good production, for example, two years ago, rushing across from Zadarius Smith. Looked good again last year. And then now him uh, and Will Anderson get to to join up together. And we'll talk about uh, their add-on defensive tackle as well. So Daniel Hunter, just an interesting player, an interesting situation. I think he's going to be able to produce there, put his hand in the dirt, go ahead and run straight and run straight fast. What'd you have from a stats perspective for Daniel Hunter? Yeah, I mean, I, I love this from Houston, right? We talk about timelines. Like, this is their time to go out and get a, a very seasoned uh, edge rusher and, and someone who can play a lot of snaps for them. So he played 88.4% of his team snaps last year, which was sixth most among all edge rushers. He's still on the right side of 30, so he can do that again, you know, with with uh, some age curve built in there. But Houston didn't have an edge that played more than 70% of their snaps last season. So him and Will Anderson going into year two can be guys that are like staples at the edge position for them. They won't have to do as much of a rotation because of the talent that they have there. So I think that's pretty exciting from the Texans perspective. And, you know, our friend Arif Hassan put out a an article about Daniel Hunter versus Jonathan Grenard and like what some of the advanced stats say. And we even get a shout out in the article. So, you know, appreciate that Arif if you're listening. And, and so be sure to check that out for like more info on this topic. Dude, don't you just assume that everyone's listening? <laughs> I mean, I, I would hope, I would hope that Arif is, uh, is going back and, and throwing in some of the, the stats that we have here and the, the scheme points from you in that article. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it. Arif does a great job. Uh, I follow his sub stack has done a lot of really good work, particularly recently uh, and continuing in Houston. So they add Hunter, obviously they have Will Anderson and then Danico Autry, another player who, uh, so now I think we'll going forward, we'll talk about a few defensive tackles. Uh, and I really like that pass rush unit thinking about just talking about the giants and those three guys. Now you got, if Autry is at kind of that three technique, you got Hunter and Will Anderson at the edge. And then even going further into their back, like I like Singletary, I like Petrie, uh, in the back seven. And, you know, I think you can make some qualms. Maybe they want to add uh, a cornerback, but where I thought, like, was I going to keep talking myself into the Texans? And then I was thinking about it, you know? Obviously, as I just said, like progress for everyone isn't linear. It's not just going to automatically get better. Uh, so maybe even if they hit some regression on offense, I feel like they can find a little bit more strength on defense. Obviously, I think so highly of uh, D'Amico Ryan's from a game plan perspective. And just like, I feel like last year we watched them play just really fast. And then now it can be like really fast and then also really, really good together. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of excited for that. Just talking myself into uh, the Texans once again. But for Danico Autry, Tage, what'd you have as a stat for him? You talk about maybe their coverage not being super strong compared to their pass rush. And I think what Autry is going to provide in particular is quick pressures. So he had a 2.44 uh, second average time to pressure last season, which was the 10th best among defensive tackles. And it's very important for these defensive tackles to get home in under 2.5 seconds. That's like usually classified as a, as a quick pressure. And when he can do that from the three technique, like you talked about, that's really going to help their coverage, their back end, um, and, and make everything easier for them. Yeah, and you know, maybe that or that feels like a little bit of the approach in San Francisco or what it was previously. Obviously, you get mm -hmm. those those four pass rushers that are really able to make life easier in a lot of different ways. But yeah, like I said, just continue to talk myself in the Texans once again. Staying uh on defensive tackles, Christian Wilkins, just one of my like favorite players, I think, uh, in the league. He's just so he is so explosive. He's such a fun player to watch. He's quick, he's strong, he's really violent in the run game, he can shed blockers. Uh, I'm most excited. He obviously are, is joining Max Crosby, whether it's, you know, them rushing on the same side, uh, whether it's them stunting in different ways, both of them against the run in different ways. Uh, Tej, what'd you have for Christian Wilkins? Yeah. So I thought this stat from next gen stats was pretty crazy. Christian Wilkins had 18 pressures when double teamed last year. That's just him as an individual defensive tackle. The Raiders defensive tackles combined had 15 pressures when double teamed. So he had three more than, than all the Raiders defensive tackles as a group. And so you throw him into that defensive line. Like you mentioned, like you have Max Crosby there. Like, I think they're going to work really well together. Um, you know, especially with, with how good of, of run defenders they both are. And then like Wilkins, I think is a, an underrated pass rusher, uh, you know, especially with that pressure stat that I mentioned as well. That's some good stats work. I, I, I like that one comparing it to the whole, uh, Raiders team there uh so we're, we are going to talk about two other or at least two other defensive tackles do you like are we moving towards 
defensive tackles are a premium position, Tej, or am I am I just getting too excited that whenever we say uh, like premium position, we should just make them all premium positions? <laughs> Well, I, th- I mean, I think you you bring up a, a very valid point here. I think defensive tackle has been a premium position for the last couple of years now. Um, again, like you look at which defensive tackles are the highest paid in the league, and basically all of the top 15 except two were drafted in the first round. You go back to that top 15, um, at, you know, how often they make free agency article we talked about a couple of weeks ago, only 13.3% of the top defensive tackles in the league actually made it to free agency. 80% of them were drafted by their own team. So that that 13.3% is the third lowest in the league, only with quarterback and wide receiver behind them. So I think it's been a premium position and, and it will continue to be because of a lot of the, the research that Eric has done, finding out about like the second order effects of what defensive tackles can do to make third down harder even if they're not on the field for third down and different stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I also think that all defenses that if they you know, want to play light boxes or really it could be kind of fancy in coverage in a lot of different ways when you're rotating on the back end, sometimes that's going to depend on can you at least at the start of the snap just have that six-man box and you're able to do that a lot easier when you have a defensive tackle that is a game wrecker or can really you know eat uh, offensive linemen up in different ways and it feels like, I don't know, just like starting to look at some of the draft stuff. It's not like we have uh, an Aaron Donald replacement kind of coming through the door. That's an unfair uh, one. Not that a, like a future Hall of Famer is going to get drafted right away. But uh, it yeah, it feels like whether it, we call it premium or not, it's like incredibly important. And I think uh, maybe just like a handful of years ago, I think defensive tackles were probably underrated. And now we see them more as, you know, it is important to be able to uh, be more flexible on the back end, able to stop the run from that light box and give your team flexibility you know push that that third down a little bit further back the next events tackle we'll talk about is dj reader going from cincinnati to detroit what do you have on uh reader tage so i mean the the caveats with reader is is he's older and, and coming off a leg injury but what i'm excited about is to see him against ali mcneil which is kind of the theme of this section is like is seeing some of these combinations on defensive line like i think when you look at McNeil, he was an above average pass rush win rate guy last year. Um, you know, DJ Reader was was pretty similar in that regard, also. And like the the thing is, you can't double team both of them now, um, where they can both get home on like or they can both at least get past the interior offensive linemen on about ten percent of snaps. Again, according to that chat or that chart by Seth Walder. So like if you're if you're not able to double double team both of them on a play, you expect one of them to to have a, a fair shot at getting to the quarterback. You pair that with Aiden Hutchinson and then the, the edge rotation on the other side. And like, you start to see a, a vision for the, the Lions defensive line. Yeah. Reader is just a player who is, is like fascinating to literally watch. I think he's just the perfect example when like, sometimes people watch football and be like, Oh, like, is that big guy really that athletic? And it's like, yes, DJ reader. So clearly proves it. There's a bunch of clips where he's like taking the center on and a guard is pushing him over. So like, he looks like he's getting like bent in half, but he's able to stay on one leg. It's just a really, really strong, strong run defender. And a good defensive tackle really does make a linebacker's life easier, whether it's like the split seconds of how much, like, or like how long does a guard have to like lock onto you in that double team before they can climb to the linebacker? Like, are you able to keep your linebackers clear in different ways? I do think Reader can play all three downs, push that pocket. He, I would imagine he's at one tech well. McNeil is kind of at that three technique. And like you said, Hutchinson rushing as well. I think he showed a nice jump again last year. So I think that reader is someone who can make everyone's life easier, uh, including Hutchinson, where now we now we're looking at Detroit's defense where they have new cornerbacks in. You just need to hit on, you know, like maybe one and a half of those guys there. Your defensive line is is certainly improved uh by that player. Maybe that has the effect of making your linebackers life. A little easier are you talking yourself into the the detroit defense stage even before the draft <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm glad that they're trying to give aaron glenn a little bit of help i think he's a fine defensive coordinator that's just been given a, a bad uh hand of cards lately where it's like there just hasn't been much talent on the lions defense in the past couple of years and that's caused them to not perform well and i think that hopefully uh there's there's a little bit more injection of, of talent this year that the players can stay a little bit healthier and he can he can kind of cook up some defensive schemes yeah, so Reader leaves the Cincinnati Bengals, and then Sheldon Rankins goes from Houston uh, to Cincinnati to pretty much you know, fill that spot. Uh, and that kind of goes back to what we were talking about, Cincinnati, just a bunch of moves 
on defense. This is it's going to be a defense that I'm just interested to watch uh, all year. The Bengals they like to stunt with Ray Hendrickson, and then Rankins is really just you know a solid solid player. I think that flashes uh, even higher in spurts. What you have on Sheldon Rankins? Yeah, so I always think this is funny when you see a player go to a team that they had a great performance against. And again, Next Gen Stats had put out something after the texans Bengals Week 10 matchup about how Sheldon Rankins had a 27% pressure rate in that game, you know, seven total pressures. So it's like the Bengals saw what he could do firsthand. And then that's not even mentioning how good of a run defender he is ninth in tackle for loss rate last year. Like the Bengals continue to, to make a lot of these signings where these players show up well in advanced metrics. They, they look good to you on film and, and they're able to get them for less of a price than paying at the top of the position. And then and, and they, they can continue a, a pretty good defense that way. Yeah, I, I love that point. Like when you can draw the direct line or even like a lot of, uh, whether it's like quarterbacks that are on kind of like in the middle of their first contract or on their uh, second contract and get picked up as a backup quarterback where teams are like, you know, we uh, like watched his, him in preparation for the draft and what kind of preparation in the past kind of does for you on the players that you look going forward. And yeah, if you're, if you're watching a player dominate you, sometimes it's kind of hard to, to ignore that. Uh, let's finish off Tej with linebackers. Just a few of them here. Patrick Queen, I think is going to be the big one going from Baltimore to Pittsburgh, you know, we, we talked about him a bunch with the Ravens last year. Obviously, he's playing next to Roquan Smith, playing in just an awesome, awesome defense. He like uses a battering ram on on stunts a lot of times where he's like picking a player. So I'm really curious, like, what does it, is his role going to become where you're away from Roquan Smith? You're going to take on like a different amount of responsibility. I thought the Ravens did an awesome job of you put so much on Roquan Smith's plate. So Patrick Queen's plate just looks a little bit different. Uh, what'd you have from a stat there uh, for Patrick Queen? Yeah, so something we've researched with linebackers in the past is like the trade off that two linebackers can make in the same defense. Where you think about Levante David and Devin White, who we're about to talk about, you think about Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen, where if you have that that really well rounded linebacker, that second linebacker in the defense can kind of play more free, play more sideline to sideline, try to rush the passer more often. And that's what Patrick Queen, I think, was in this Baltimore defense last year. So I, again, like I'm I'm very curious to see how he does in Pittsburgh. He he had a 18 pressures, 2.46 time to pressure last year. Mike McDonald used him really, really well because he had Roquan Smith to kind of shoulder some of the other linebacker duties. So it'll be interesting to see how Terrell Austin and Mike Tomlin end up using him in the Steelers defense. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the the kind of linebacker duos thing, because I guess even just making this doc, that's not something that uh, I was thinking of right away. And that's a, a smart point. Like, it feels like like every single position, it, it is like, how are you complimenting the player next to you? And if you have a star, you're able to to let that other a player. I like the, the way you put it kind of play freer in a few different ways. So then the next one, it's going to be, or we're going to talk about Devin White going from Tampa Bay to Philadelphia. And like the Eagles linebacker room, uh, obviously I think just a topic of conversation for like all fans in Philadelphia since like Jeremiah Trotter was there. Uh, that room is now, I guess the starters it's, it's Devin white. And then you hope that Nicobe Dean is back there. The Eagles, like they really, they just like needed someone in, in that spot. Like they literally had to fill the spots on their roster. Uh, I think Fangio likes to send that kind of weak side inside linebacker on a blitz a lot. Uh, so you think that I think Devin White on film still shows up as a good blitzer. Like that is certainly a skill that he has. I think Fanjo used uh, Jerome Baker kind of plugging the line on some run plays last year. Maybe that's the kind of type of role uh, that he has. It, it was a fairly low price. I think, I think it's like a one year and just a couple of million dollars there. What'd you have on Devin White for the Eagles? I mean, you think about how ravaged the Eagles linebackers were, uh, you know, which is a very uh, popular conversation topic for you and Shiel on the Philly special where it's like, yeah, you, N'Kobe Dean was injured last year. You, you were starting guys. You didn't want to start at linebacker this year. N'Kobe Dean is, is coming back from injury. You signed Devin White from Tampa. You signed Oren Burks from San Francisco. You signed Zach Bond from New Orleans. So that's when we talk about like throwing darts at the dartboard. Like that was Howie Roseman's approach to this linebacker room. I know that the Devin White uh, you know, didn't have the best year last year. I still think he can be fine in coverage. He he had a 62% completion percentage when targeted, which was the second best, second lowest among linebackers, a negative 3.1% CPOE when targeted, which was the 11th best. Like his, his tackling was, was pretty down. Um, but it, I still think he can play in coverage. He can give the Eagles a warm body there and kind of fit into that linebacker rotation, especially on, on late downs. And, and, you know, if they want to have him to rush the passer instead of dropping back in coverage. 
So the the conversation we had earlier on kind of cornerbacks like throwing darts at the dartboard, uh, and then conversing that are kind of conversely with like the linebacker duos kind of working together. I don't know. Do you like? Do you think it's smart? Do you approach the linebacker room as kind of throwing darts at the dartboard, or is it like, hey, you know, we gotta find complementary skill sets and like so last year for example they like were almost like cycling out linebackers together in different ways and i felt like they were just trying to kind of find or were trying to find what was would work and at the end of the day kind of felt like unfortunately none of that really really worked out well so what, do you, what are your thoughts on kind of just like throwing darts to the dartboard at the linebacker position yeah i mean i i, I like that strategy for positions that are are weak links and that there are like multiple starting slots for those so like we talked about it for for cornerbacks we were we're also talking about it for linebackers like i think it's a very fair strategy to try out because like those positions are, are one harder to measure each each year to year but also like a little bit more uh or less stable than than the some of the other positions that we've talked about or some of the other production measures that we discussed so like i think that when you when you try this many times to get the right linebacker room i assume that they're going to draft someone probably on day two um that that can kind of like come in there and, and also provide a, a chance to start like th there's just going to be a solid rotation in philly because of all that they have invested there yeah and i think you know i think Vic fan is a really good uh coach and he comes from a linebacker background perspective uh obviously hopefully all the the pieces kind of mesh in there and someone who fans you had last year andrew van ginkle we're going to end on just uh, two last players here uh van ginkle was one that I wanted to mention because like it it was it's such a clear like one to one I, I think in a lot of things you have to do last year where you're kind of on that edge spot uh, rushing the passer dropping out into coverage in a few different ways under Fangio and now with Brian Flores where the Vikings have that kind of like weird three through five kind of feel of a defense where you can kind of plug that in and I've seen a bunch of film of Van Kinkle doing one thing and he's gonna able I I think he's gonna be able to do that in a minute so do you have a stat for uh, Andrew Van Ginkle? Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned with his pass rush, he had a 2.28 time to pressure last year, which was the third best in the NFL. I think he'll pair very nicely with Grenard, where he's the type of guy to, to get pressures very quickly. Grenard more, uh, you know, has has uh, more of a plan, like you mentioned, where he can kind of get there slower. Into, so if Van Hinkle is getting and knocking the quarterback off his spot, I think we'll see a couple times where Jonathan Grenard ends up finishing the sack or finishing the quarterback hit on the play. So it'll be cool to see that dynamic between those, those two edge rushers. All right, and let's close off on Aziz Al Shair. Uh, I mean, can I be like any more optimistic about Houston? I, I really, I really don't know. But I like that them. It feels like they, you know, really vamped up or ramped up that uh, kind of front seven in a few different ways. What'd you have for a stat on him? So Aziz Al Shair, I think was was a, a very underrated signing. I think it's going to work out really nicely for Houston. He was eighth in yards allowed per pass snap last season among linebackers with at least 50% of snaps played. So again, you talk about that front seven uh, across the board. Like I think there's so much talent there. And then the, the you know, Houston is, is going to be able to probably take advantage of what they have in the front seven to, to complement some of their missing pieces in the back seven. All right, Tej, I think that that finishes up all the, the players we want to talk about on offense last week and defense this week. Were there any like honorable mentions or just like a team you want to kind of tip your hat hat to real quick or anything else you want to close on before we get out of here? <laughs> well, I think a couple of the teams that we complimented throughout were like the Texans and the, the Bengals, um, you know, just overall approaches to free agency, understanding, you know, what the AFC is made up of, the kinds of moves that you have to do to compete in it. And I, I'm, I'm very excited to watch those defenses next year. Yeah, I like when teams do kind of like tell us who they are or like show us where they are at in their kind of uh, team building phase. I love that at least whatever you think of the Texans moves, like I think that they understand like, you know, they're in the window. Like they they're making the moves now uh, and whether, you know, certain some things you're going to pay for a little bit more down the road. Uh, it feels like that that was a fun one for them to be able to do. And I feel like Tej, now that we close for agency, we can officially start mentally thinking about the draft, maybe talking about the draft in the upcoming weeks i like the idea of like teams that are able to you know plug those big big holes in free agency so it gives you a little bit more flexibility uh in the draft i think like the lions may be an example of that work man still have, still have some holes uh on defense but like i think that maybe they're an example of a team that has a little bit more flexibility in the draft that's a great point like i think when you enter the draft 
with a clear hole or a clear need that might hold you back from competing for the playoffs, competing for, uh, you know, uh, to play in your conference championship game. Like that, that's a pretty big red flag of like, if you're counting on a rookie to come in and play 80% of snaps for you at this position, when there's like a 50, 50 shot that they'll be ready to do that. Um, you know, you're, you're really giving it up to, to like a coin flip there, but like, if you can plug some of those holes in free agency, even if you're just getting C level players that can play, you know, 40% of your snaps, but like at least be there in case the rookie needs some, some inclination period. Like, I think that's very helpful for how to approach free agency and to think about you know, the types of moves you want to make. Yeah. And then as those teams move to the draft, obviously teams that feel like they have their quarterback situation settled, it feels like they have almost like an unfair advantage, like the Cardinals and Chargers at four and five in this draft. That's a spot where I think a lot of people are looking All right, Well, do you trade up uh, to that spot in some way? And like you mentioned, you know, expecting a rookie to just come in and like be an all pro. That is such a rarity. And now it feels like we just talked about free agency where before free agency, we did a little bit of, you know, like sometimes it, it, it may be a splashy signing, but their production in the new spot isn't always the best. Now we're already like starting off sour on, uh, rookies joining team stage. It feels like you know every podcast we do together, I try and bring all this positivity, and then we end up with the result that like th- these things actually aren't helping your team uh, as much as you think. Well, I mean, second week in a row, we're referencing the two guys on the bus meme, <laughs> where it's like <laughs> it's the sad guy looking out the window. Um, it's the happy guy looking out the other window. Like that's, that's what it is when you start getting into these advanced numbers and, and looking at the impact of some of these moves is you become less excited about them, but like everyone should be like you or you're just excited about everyone. All right. You, know, you mentioned the meme. That means it is time to get <laughs> out of here. Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of stats and scheme. Visit us uh, at sumersports.com. Follow us on Twitter and YouTube at sumer sports. Leave a nice rating review wherever you choose to be. Uh, Next week, we'll have some fun uh, draft stuff in store for you. But most importantly, enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you next time.